this life is to have loved you, Lord. It is enough for me. At the end of the day, just to know you, Lord. And it is enough for me. Of day, 
Good morning, church. Welcome for those of you who are here with us in this place. And very warm welcome to those who are tuning in from home with your families, with yourselves. Those of us who are here, can you just lock eyes with someone else and in a non-creepy way, greet them with your eyes? <laughs> Wave to them. All right. So good to be in this place again. Uh, you know, we had to go through a season of, you know, uh, closing services for a period of time. Uh, and, you know, we have been through quite a number of changes and it's more than just the pandemic, right? Uh, there, there are many reasons for us to feel unsettled. One, two weeks ago, quite a number of us were parents. We were unsettled by these two characters called Helen and Ivan. Okay? And we were trying to solve this PSLE question, like how many coin, how many coin do they have? Uh, and yesterday at 12 noon, right, uh, our Prime Minister came up and some of us were unsettled as we watched the entire um, broadcast for, for different reasons, right? Some of us were really unsettled because where is his magic cup, right? He didn't bring out his magic cup. Uh, and, and some of us were unsettled by the shift in posture that as a nation we're going to take, right? And, and that the numbers will start to come up before it goes down. Um, and those of us who have loved ones, you know, uh, the, especially those who are vulnerable, he hearing such things can be unsettling. Um, the changes that come about have been unsettling, right? Mental health has been an issue. Uh, but I want to take this chance for, to encourage all of us, you know, in Isaiah 26 verse 3, it says, God will keep in perfect peace those who place our trust in Him and those who fix their thoughts on Him, all right? I know it's not easy when we're bombarded by, you know, a lot of information and information that, you know, sometimes changes. But I think this is a choice that we make, all right? We choose to fix our thoughts. We choose to fix our eyes. We choose to place our trust in Him. You know, in last Sunday sermons, Joshua, uh, told us to be watchful and well-prepared disciples. We do not know the time of Christ's coming. The instruction for us is to be watchful, to receive. Posture our hearts. We don't know when it's going to happen, but when it happens, our posture is what matters. Right? I think similarly, we don't know what's going to happen around us, but our posture, the posture of our heart is what matters. So, River Life family, I want to encourage us to have, to, to look beyond the immediate, all right? Let's sow into the things that count for eternity and into God's kingdom, all right? Let's be disciples who would look beyond the earthly, fix our eyes on Jesus, fix our eyes on the eternal kingdom, all right? Those are the things that will not change. And let's find our certainty and our hope in things that do not change, all right? Let's be faithful disciples that would listen to the voice of God and obey, and obey Him. Can I invite all of us to stand as we prepare our hearts to enter into a time of praise and worship? All right. And those at home, if you'd like to stand, uh, do join us. Lord, we come before You this day. Many things are on our mind. But Lord, this day we want to choose to fix our eyes on You. Lord, this day we choose in faith to place our trust in You. And Lord, as Your Word promises, Lord Father, as we make that choice to trust You, to think about You, to focus on You, Lord Father, Your peace is, is, is what has been promised to us. So Lord, we pray, Lord Father, that as, as we make this choice, as we posture our hearts to come before You in worship and to exalt Your name above our circumstances, Lord Father, we pray, Lord Father, that You will break through for us in our hearts, in our lives, in our spirit, Lord Father. Lord, I pray that You will encounter us as we enter into this time of praise and worship, Lord. Encounter us, Lord Father. Thank You, Lord. In Jesus' name. Sherman. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I just want to quickly share a very um, quick story. Yeah, um, we're going to sing Blessed Assurance in a while, and I'm sure everyone knows this song. But um, 
I think what really struck our hearts this week when we were planning for, planning for this set is that we um, want to find out a bit of the background of the song. Yeah, so this uh, Blessed Assurance, this song was written by this lady called Fanny Jane Crosby. Long, long, long time ago. <laughs> I really don't know how long ago, but very long ago. Lah. Yeah, and the thing about her is that um, she was blind from the age of six. Yeah, so she was blind from the age of six and it's not like... Um, not something that happened naturally. It was a medical mishap. So she went to the doctor and then like the doctor gave the wrong treatment and then she became blind from there at six years old. So like as if that isn't Tiala enough, right? Um, so, she, so she was blind from the age of six and then after that when she actually had a child, she, she lost the child as well. Yeah, so she, uh, she had a miscarriage and she lost the child and, and yet throughout her life, she was known as someone who was just so focused like what Sean Kong was sharing just now just so focused and so fixed on things that were above yeah so in this verse you know uh, in one of the verses it says watching and waiting looking above and I think that was like the embodiment of her life and today I think even as we enter into a time of worship I just want to encourage you let's really fix our eyes on things above I don't know what our weeks were I don't know what we're going through today but I just want to encourage you to put everything aside and um, say, Father, today, you know, we are choosing, like what Sean said, we are really choosing to fix our eyes on you. We're watching and waiting. We're looking above. Yeah, so that is my encouragement to you today, even as we start worship. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. in his blood This is my story This is my soul Praising my Savior All the day long This is my
2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 to 18, it says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things are unseen are eternal. God, we look to you. God, we look to your coming. We keep our eyes fixed upon the kingdom that is to come. Lord, give us a heart that is yearning, Lord, after you. And after, for, after your return, this morning we fix our eyes. We turn our affections toward you, Lord. Soon in 
Church, that is the hope that we have in Christ. And that is what we look forward to that one day. Lord, we want to fix our eyes on you, Lord Father. And we look forward so much to the day that we will be in your presence forever and ever, fellowshipping with you yes Lord you are our hope you are our hope Lord Father yes God fix our eyes on you Lord Jesus Just move in this place as we linger on a little bit more. Minister to us in this place, Lord Father, as we come before your throne and we lay down our lives, we lay down our hearts before your altar, Lord. Touch us, Lord Father. Touch us, Lord Father.
Here we are, Lord Father. Here we are. Here we are. Come and visit us, Lord Father. Show us and reveal to us your spirit, your face. As we enter into your presence, Lord. Lord, we want to give thanks that wherever we are, we can still worship you, we can connect with you, Lord Father. And that you would come and meet us wherever we are. Lord, we want to give thanks that we can come before you in worship, Lord. And that we can lift up your name. And we want to be able to lift your name far above our circumstances this day, Lord Father. And Lord, we want to exalt you to the highest place. Lord, we want to exalt you to, our, to the highest place. That nothing can take away our praise, nothing can take away our worship, Lord Father. So Lord, we bless your name in this place. We bless your name in our homes and we exalt you, Lord Jesus. We exalt you, Lord Jesus. We exalt you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for this time of worship. May I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Those who are here, why don't we give God a big praise offering and exalt the name of Jesus with our claps. Lord. Before you're seated, before you're seated, turn to someone and with your eyes, all right, greet them, wave to them, tell them with your eyes, it's so good to see you here in this place. All right, got a couple of announcements. We are on this new sermon series, series called Jesus is Coming Back, all right, so this is the second week and, and this whole series is just, is, is beyond the weekly Sunday sermons, all right? It's also accompanied by the River Life Prayer Room, uh, and that's happening every Tuesday at 8 p.m., all right? Uh, and this coming Tuesday, our prayer room team will partner with the Burning Hearts team for a special time of worship and intercession. We also have equipping sessions on Thursdays, right, with Peter Sukahira. So Thursdays, 8 p.m., so this coming Thursday, the topic will be on the Antichrist, right? Very interesting, right? Okay, so more information can be found in the digital bulletin, uh, and we hope to be able to see you at our Tuesdays and Thursdays sessions. Okay, uh, 8th of October, two days ago, was uh, set aside as Children's Day, okay? And children have a special place in God's heart, all right? You know, in... in in Matthew and in Luke, it says that when the children were coming to, to God, right, uh, to Jesus, uh, and hoping to get a touch uh, from, from Jesus, the disciples kind of rebuked them and stopped them. Uh, but Jesus said, right, don't, don't, don't hinder them, right? Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. Do not put any obstacles in their path. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven belongs to them, all right? Those of us who are at home and you have our kids, uh, don't want to ask you to lay hands out. Can you grab your child with you? I'm going to spend some time praying for them. Okay, I know adult service, you don't have the children, but if you're with your kids at home, can, can, we, can we just hold them? And can you just pray this prayer of blessing for them? Lord, we know that children have a special place in your heart. And Lord, we know that the kingdom of God belongs to them, they have said in your word. So Lord, I pray, Lord Father, and pray a, a prayer of blessing over these young lives, that there will be nothing that hinders them from coming to you, Lord Jesus. In this day and age of so many distractions, so many priorities, uh, all of these can be seen as obstacles that come in the way of coming to the feet of Jesus. But Lord, we want to pray a prayer of blessing today, Lord Father, that there will be no obstacles. There will be no obstacles that stops them from coming to Jesus. And Lord, I pray, Lord Father, that they will get this glimpse of the kingdom of heaven and that they will seize this kingdom of heaven, Lord Father, Lord. So, Lord, we pray for a prayer of blessing. And Lord, just pray that you will raise them up to be the next generation of soldiers and warriors in this kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So if you have a kid, give them a hug, give them a kiss. Uh, let them know that they are special in God's eyes. Okay. Our next announcement is about our usual regular collection of tithe and offering. 
So, you know, as per usual, right, we'll be giving digitally through PayNow or Interbank. Uh, so let, let me just say a, a prayer uh, and give thanks for the offering. Lord Jesus, you are our provider. And Lord, as this, uh, as we di dig into our pockets, Lord Father, uh, let us be reminded that you are the God who provides. And Lord, all we are giving is a portion of what you have blessed us with. So Lord, whatever we uh, give back to you, Lord Father, in faith, we trust that you will take it and that you will multiply it for your kingdom's purposes. In Jesus' name. Okay. Without further ado, I'm going to invite our speaker for today, uh, which is the same speaker as last week. All right, so Joshio, the stage is yours, uh, and he'll be sharing with us on Jesus is coming back. All right, Josh. Maranatha? Yeah, you guys got it. Um, it's October the 10th, and it hit me last night as I was preparing that today is exactly four years since the Lord moved me to Singapore. And so it feels really the weight of it, and I'm like, wow, it's been four years, a lot has happened. Uh, my heart is full, but I feel like this is just the beginning of what the Lord wants to do uh, in my life here and uh, in this church. And um, last week, we unpacked a lot of information uh, on Matthew 24, uh, the signs that he's coming back. We talked through four different points. Uh, and full disclosure, uh, I actually prepared a seven-page sermon today um, and finished it yesterday at 10 p.m., skipped dinner, worked through dinner, wrote, well, okay, to be fair, I was playing Settlers of Gatan in the afternoon, but then I was working through it through dinner and about 10 p.m., I stopped, and I, I, something I like to do now, especially that I have a wife who loves the Lord and is grounded in Scripture, I run, I run by my sermon with her, and we, we talk through it together. And after I did that last night at 10 p.m., we both sat there and said, this is not what the Lord wants to say tomorrow. <laughs> and so at 10 p.m., um, started writing a new sermon, and I was sitting there and asking the Lord, Lord, what is it? What's on your heart? What, what, why, why not this sermon? I mean, like, it's four points. It corresponds to my previous four points. It's going to be solid. And he just put this phrase on my heart. He said, nothing will make sense if they don't already long for my return. Nothing will make sense if they don't already long for my return. And I felt an invitation to the Lord. So last night, even as I was preparing, I was pressing in in prayer, and asking for the Lord to awaken our hearts to long for His return. And that's the, we're, we're still in the same text. Don't worry, we're not going to fly to some different Bible, uh, book of the Bible. But we're in Matthew 24. But this is, this is me asking you, would you pray with me? Would you pray for me? Even as I bring the Word of God to you this morning, I, I come with fear and trembling. I come uh, with a heart that's full, but also realizing that the Lord desires to do something in our hearts today. Um, so I've called the title of the sermon today, Why We Don't Long for Jesus to Return. And so would you just pray with me today? Father, I'm asking today for strength. I'm asking for courage. I'm asking, Holy Spirit, for, for ears to hear for those who will listen today. And Father, I'm asking for myself for utterance to be given to me, that I would boldly open my mouth to make known the mystery of your gospel. Father, I'm asking in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would strengthen us to hear your word. Father, that you will cause our hearts to be awakened with longing for the man Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So why don't we long for Jesus to return? I have four reasons for you today. Um, and in talking about these things, my prayer is that our hearts would become awakened to longing for his return. So why we don't long for him to return? Number one, <laughs> we don't care. Matthew 24 verse 12 says this, the love of, wow, uh, thank you, Gwen. You know, if I was preparing this till 2 a.m. last night, it means that Gwen probably got up really early to give you slides. So thank you so much for doing this. <laughs> I owe you coffee. Matthew 24, verse 12. It says, the love of many will grow cold. 
My friends, we are in a season here at River Life where the Lord is trumpeting a message for those who have ears to hear. This year, we've been going through this book called Crazy Love. Some of you are like, okay, I haven't finished it yet. Go finish it, right? Crazy Love. Um, but there's a reason why the Lord is trumpeting this message. You know, I, I personally, like, he, he did something in my heart earlier this year in April. Many of you know that we uh, just released an album, right? The Behold album. In April was our recording, our live recording. And uh, this is a little bit of behind the scenes for you because it's, it's going to connect to what I'm saying. So we recorded a bunch of songs over two days. And one of the songs we recorded was Purify, right? We, we've sung it here in church many times. And in a few of the songs, we actually... We actually set aside a bit of time and we say it's going to be a spontaneous moment, right? We plan to be spontaneous. That's the plan in me. We set aside this time and we're like, okay, God, whatever you want to say in that moment is what we will sing. And so I was leading this song with my wife who was pregnant there and that was the only, there were only two days in her entire first trimester that she didn't feel like throwing up. And one of those days was when she got to sing that song with me. And so we were sitting there and as we came to that part of the song, um, and, you know, I was thinking, okay, God's going to give me a, 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 a chorus about revival, about, you know, the purifying of hearts, you know, be an intense, powerful chorus. And as I sat there and as I was waiting on the Lord, He just put one word in my mind. And that word was Laodicea. And I got a shock, actually. If you, if you, watch, the, if you watch the video, like, I'm sitting there for quite a while because I'm like, wait, what do, what do you mean Laodicea? And that's when that, that, that spontaneous chorus of, of don't let our hearts be cold. You know, we don't want to be naked, wretched, poor, and blind. That's, that's how it came about. This was in April, guys. And to be honest, very, very vulnerable of you guys, right? After we finished, we, we stopped the recording. I was just overcome with this feeling of like inadequacy. I was overcome with this feeling of like, man, that was not a very anointed chorus you know, I shared this with a, with a group of uh, the, the RPR people. I was like, I was sitting there, I was like, man, I feel like I blew it. I had that one chance to come up with some anointed worship and I came up with, don't let my heart be cold. I'm like, it doesn't even make sense, right? And in the post-production, I, I was actually thinking, what if we cut this out completely? You know, like, use Sherman's song. Sherman's song is so much more powerful. You know, like, why do we cut this part out completely? But something kept me from doing it. In May during our e-gathering, and this was the same day, and, and we hadn't, I mean, we didn't know what Francis Chan was going to talk about in April. Uh, in May, when we released, the same day that we released the album was the day that Francis Chan was speaking at our e-gathering, and he spoke on the church of Laodicea. And the moment he started speaking, this, the, a holy fear hit my heart, and God was like, good thing you didn't cut that out. And it hit me that he is trumpeting. He's speaking from heaven. Revelation 3, verse 17 to 19. It says, For you say, I am rich, I've prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. Self to anoint your eyes so that you may see. And then he says, those whom I love. Guys, do you know that he loves you? Do you know you're loved by God right now, here in this moment? And he says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Those whom I love, I chasten. And he says, so be zealous and repent. And I looked at the, the NLT, the New Living Translation, it says this, So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Turn away from indifference. You know, as I was, I was thinking about this, this issue of indifference, I was going through my notes and like looking at, at, at things that I've written in my journal, and I came across this quote that a good friend of mine actually, who, who was teaching in the burn internship in the House of Prayer, and her name is Melanie, and she said this, if to love is to obey, and we know this, right? To love is to obey God. If to love is to obey, when I don't obey, it's not an obedience problem. It's a love problem. If I find it difficult to obey, it's because I love something else more than I love God. 
That something else can be ministry, it can be people, it can be reputation, ambition, family, even myself. My friends, what do we love more than God? When He's calling us to obey, when He's calling us to be zealous and repent, what is that thing in the way that says, I would, but... uh." You know, I was thinking about about, you know, we sing songs like, worthy, worthy, you are worthy. Worthy are you, Jesus. Do you even know what the, the word worthy means, right? It's one of those words where we, if you grew up in the church, you're like, wow, worthy is the lamb. Hallelujah. Amen, brother. We don't know what it means. But if you think about it this way, how much something is worth you can be measured this way. Imagine for a moment, right? Every one of us has this, right? I mean, not the exact model, but you have a a cell phone. You don't have a cell phone, you can't trace together. You don't have a cell phone, you can't go in and eat. And I mean, now if you're not vaccinated, apparently you can't either. I don't know. You have all these things that you need a cell phone for. For me, right? If I don't have the cell phone, I don't... Okay, confession. I don't even know my wife's phone number. I know my mother's phone number. That's all I remember in my head. I don't, I don't know my dad or my brother's phone number. Um, I, I don't really remember uh, a, like what my schedule is. You know, I'm, I'm so dependent on this. Imagine with me right now, if tomorrow you woke up and your phone is utterly destroyed or you went to the gym and you, you accidentally crushed your phone, right? Or you, like, and, and, and suddenly everything in your phone has disappeared. Your years of photographs, your address book, you don't even know how to call your mother or your father. <laughs> everything in it disappears. And all of a sudden, your life comes crashing down. You're like, I don't even know how to drive home from Pasiris. <laughs> Imagine that, right? If that were the case, let me suggest to you that your phone is worth to you a lot. The way to tell if something is worth something to you is to imagine your life and remove this thing and if everything in your life comes crashing down, that thing is worth a lot to you. My friends, if you remove Jesus from the equation today, does anything in your life change? If nothing changes, I would suggest maybe it's not worth that much to us. But if everything falls apart, then we will say that you are worth it all. Ellie Wiesel, he is a writer, a professor, an activist, a Nobel Prize laureate. He said this famous quote, The opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. The opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. And this is so significant. Why this guy says this is because if he's more than a Nobel Prize laureate, he's more than an activist, a professor, he's a Holocaust survivor. And if you know history, you know why this is significant. Because the world, the church stood by and watched six million Jews get slaughtered. The opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. And the thing that struck me is that God is not indifferent to the return of His Son. God is not indifferent to the return of His Son, Jesus. If you look at His first coming, right? The first time Jesus came, and we're going to sing about it in a few weeks. I can't believe that Christmas is coming. (laughs) We're going to sing about it, that while shepherds watch their flocks by night, all seated on the ground, oh holy night, silent night, The first time Jesus came, nobody knew about it except a bunch of shepherds. In fact, they were watching their flocks. They didn't even know that something was happening in the city of Bethlehem. And literally, angels had to like, had to like rip open like the 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 veil between heaven and earth. And suddenly, can you imagine me? You're sitting outside on a on a cold, starlit night, and then suddenly the, the sky opens a little bit and this angel shows up. It's like good tidings of great joy. Do not fear. And you're like, ah! You know, you'd be afraid, right? If, if an angel, like, if, if Wiki and his girlfriend are having a picnic somewhere and then, like, all of a sudden an angel appears, you'd be like, you'll just drop all your stuff and run, right? It's like whoever runs the fastest gets to outrun the angel. There's fear in our hearts when something like this happens, right? But the Lord literally, God literally had to wake up these shepherds and say, guys, something is about to happen. Here's the king of kings, 
The Lord of Lords, all of heaven, imagine with me, right? All of heaven looks at Jesus, all of heaven bows and worships every angel that has been created, knows the Son of God, the Lamb who was slain before the foundations of the world, and then He comes to the earth and nobody welcomes Him. Imagine if your Prime Minister went to my country, Malaysia, and he arrives at the airport, and there's not a kompang, you know, like the bun dung dung dung. Like there's no one to welcome him. Like I think it'll be war between our countries, right? If 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 a dignitary such as your prime minister shows up in my country and nobody welcomes him, that was the indignity that Jesus suffered when he came the first time. And let me tell you something: when Jesus came, he came to reveal the Father. He came to show us the way to Him. It's Jesus saying, "Israel, you know." You know your God, but you don't know the Father, and I'm here to show him to you. But let me tell you, my friends, the second time he comes, when he returns, God is not going to let Jesus suffer the indignity of coming unannounced. Every eye will see him. All of history, the birth pains that we talked about, it's going to come to a crescendo where God will turn off every other competing light so that all eyes will look upon this man who comes like lightning that comes from the east to the west. Isaiah prophesies that the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and some flesh, no, all flesh, all flesh will see it together. It's the Father saying, what you know about my son is true, but you haven't seen anything yet. You don't know who I know. And I'm going to show him to you. I'm going to put him on display. I'm going to reveal this man whose eyes burn with fire, whose head and hair is white as wool and white as snow. He's not the baby in the manger anymore. He's not Jesus who is tattered and torn on the cross. He's a man who is burning with fire and desire. He's coming to judge the nations. He's coming to rule from Jerusalem. He's a real man, guys. And he's coming back. And my prayer this morning is that the Lord would awaken us from slumber, from indifference, from our inertia, from apathy, and that God would make us care about the return of his Son. So the first thing is we don't care. That's why, one reason why we don't, we don't uh, long for the return of Christ. Number two, we don't understand. Matthew 24 verse 4 says, Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. Another version says, See that no one deceives you. So maybe our response today is not that, it's not that I don't care. I, maybe I don't understand. And I've tried, but it's, it's too difficult. My friends, I want to encourage you today that it's possible to understand. Paul didn't think it was so complicated. Paul didn't say you need a master's of divinity to understand this. In fact, when he planted the church in Thessalonica, uh, some scholars believe he was there for three Sabbaths. Uh, most believe that he was there for slightly longer, maybe three months or so. But the, the point is he was there for a short period of time. And if you read First and Second Thessalonians, it is chock full. In fact, on Thursday nights, we reference First and Second Thessalonians so many times. It's chock full of information about the coming of Christ, about His return. It formed the basis of everything that the apostles did. And when you read Hebrews 6, right? I'm, I don't know if you guys have read this before. And I remember the first time I read this, it, it struck my heart. I'm like, wait, wait a minute. What's going on here? Hebrews 6 verse 1 says, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ. What does elementary mean? Elementary is like, uh, what's the P word? The primary school students do the P, PSLE. In Malaysia, it's UPSR, okay? So PSLE. This is the elementary doctrine. It's like, Okay, maybe this is not a great uh, question, uh, not example because the other day there was a math question, PSLE. You know what I'm talking about. And I tried to do it. I was like, I don't understand what's going on. Maybe I need to go back to primary school. But yeah, the, it says, let us leave the elementary doctrine, the PSLE doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. And then he tells us, the author tells us what these elementary doctrines are. What are these PSLE subjects that we're all supposed to already know? 
And he says, repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Uh, instruction about washing, the laying on of hands, these four things, which I think we more or less know, right? If you join the family, you know this, right? And then it says, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And I remember thinking, wait, wait, isn't this like A-levels? This is not PSL. This is not elementary, right? This is, my, this is more advanced, right? But here the author says, this is what you're supposed to know. Basic level introduction. But when was the last time, other than this month, right, <laughs> that we heard sermons in our life? I remember growing up in a church, and I was like, wait, I, do, I don't even remember the last time anyone talked about Jesus coming back. I don't even remember the last time anyone talked about what it would be like to be resurrected from the dead the eternal judgment, none of these things. Yet Hebrews calls it elementary teachings. So it is possible to understand. It's meant to be simple. Or maybe you're saying, I don't understand, and I've tried, but there's so many wrong teachings out there. It's so confusing. And maybe, like some of us, and I know this, that we have become even offended. We're like, I don't want to look at this. This is like, nobody can get it. Why should we even bother? But my friends, I want to encourage you today. We have resources. <laughs> We have resources. We have Thursday nights. I don't know if you guys tuned in last Thursday. I tuned in and I, I was struck by the clarity of the teaching. You know, I was struck by it. Like when uh, Pastor Ben was facilitating this time and he was drawing out certain questions, Peter Sukahira was, was speaking truth and in such a clear way. And I realized that sometimes we don't realize it, right? It's a gift to the body of Christ to have clarity like this in this hour where everyone is running around not knowing what's going on, to have a clear voice that says, this is what the Lord is saying. And we have that, guys. Will we embrace that? Will you put it out in your, in your calendars this Thursday? Just zoom in. Nobody asked me to plug for this, but I really believe that this is something that the Lord is equipping us with. Because the, the reality is this, friends. There is warfare. There's warfare around the mind of the believer for understanding the last days. See, the enemy, right, he doesn't want the church to know about the end of the age. Because the end of the age also signifies Satan's defeat. If you were Satan, which you're not, but if you were, if you could cause confusion over one subject matter, what would it be? It would probably be my, his defeat, right? His, his de eternal destruction. See, a church that knows the end will be empowered with courage to endure through the hardest days. But if we are confused, and there is warfare right now, if we are confused, we're not going to be able to make it to the end. And I felt even to challenge you guys with all these resources we have. What if for the rest of this month, we're going through this series, Jesus is coming back. What if you would, on your own, or with your spouse, or with your family, what if you would make it your challenge, not just to depend on Sunday, not just to depend on Thursday, but to search out the Scripture. Just two chapters, friends. Matthew 24 and 25. What if you opened it up with your family, with your spouse, read the words in red. These are all Jesus' words. If we love Him, we treasure His words, right? What if we took it on our own, read it through, 24 and 25, every day, just read it through, read it through, read it through, love the word. Because what did Jesus say? His words bring clarity. He doesn't want us to be confused over the future. Or maybe you say, I don't understand. And it's not that I'm offended, or it's not that I can't understand, but I just don't see why it's important. But let me say to you, I was thinking about an analogy right, of, of uh, an engaged woman and a married woman, right? How many of you, uh, you're at 2021, 2020, the government is a little bit scared now because people are not getting married. It's like, don't worry, once you can, once people can have a big wedding in Gardens by the Bay, everyone's going to get married. <laughs> but imagine this, right? If someone gets engaged, I'm not, I'm not looking at weekend, don't worry. If someone gets engaged, <laughs> Right? And, and, and imagine women, imagine, right, 
the most eligible man, if you're not married, right? The most eligible man in River Life just proposed to you, right? And then you've gone through MPC, you've gone through all the things you need to do, you have a couple mentor, and then all that you can think about was how amazing that engagement was. Wow, he took me uh, to the top of, uh, I don't know, MBS, you know, and then like he, he did like Crazy Rich Asians, you know, and then he proposed to me, and then there were fireworks, and it's so great. And then, and then someone comes comes up to you, your best friend comes up to you and says, hey, tell me about the wedding. When's the wedding date? You know, like what, what, what's going to happen at the wedding? It's like, ah, yeah, don't talk about the wedding. The wedding is, ah, yeah, don't worry, but it. it's so far away. Just let me tell you about the engagement. It's so much cooler than the wedding. You would look at the person and go like, hey, something's wrong. <laughs> something's wrong if you're more preoccupied with the engagement than you are with the wedding. My friends, the gospel is so much more than what Jesus has done. It's not just the 89 apostolic chapters in the, in, in the gospels about what he has already done. It's 150 chapters of what he's, all, he's coming to do. It's not just what he has done, it's what he will do. If we are proclaiming the first coming without the second coming, we are only proclaiming half the gospel. If we do not set our hope on the return of Jesus, it actually introduces a dullness in our hearts because we are designed to live with hope. The cross was the engagement. The cross was what secured the promises of God. But I didn't fulfill all of them. Jesus' return, the marriage, the wedding day, fulfills all all the promises that have been secured. My friends, are we more excited about our engagement or are we more excited about our wedding? And maybe you're saying, oh, I really, I, Josh, I, I want to, but I don't know how to do it. And I just want to encourage you today that it's okay if we don't understand now. Let's do this as family. I believe it's, I'm not just being you know, mushy about it. Like, let's do it as family. It's biblical. Let's do this as family. Second John chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. It says, this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. And this is uh, John saying we have to love one another, right? Why? Because many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not confess the coming of Christ in the flesh, such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. John is calling us to love one another. Why? Because many deceivers have gone out into the world. Guys, what we can draw from this is this. Life in love together as a family, as community, is a great protection against deception. Life together in love is a great protection against deception. To love biblically is to love centered on God and what He says. What this means is meaning what binds my heart to your heart. What binds, look at, look at your neighbor, right? What binds your heart to that person's heart? What binds your heart to your community? Is that we all have said yes to what God tells us is good. His commandments are good. We don't get to invent the ways of love. We learn them from the Word of God. This is the picture. It's a picture of a community who love each other in this way that will not easily be deceived. It's a picture of, you know, Daniel's friends in the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach and Abednego, right? It's them saying, we will not bow, we will not cave in to our culture. Our culture says, do this. We're like, no, no, no. That's not what God says. It's Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego standing before King Nebuchadnezzar and saying, King, we will not bow to you. And even if, if like, our God will deliver us, even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow. Even if he doesn't, we still love him. It's a community of people pledging their allegiance to God to walk according to His commandments that their love for God and for one another deepens and they are protected from deception. My friends, who are these people that form this community for you? If River Life were to shut down tomorrow, 
right? Whether it's COVID or whatever, if we were to shut down tomorrow, close the doors, barricade the gates, and we cannot gather like this, who are the people in your life, your authentic spiritual community, who will love you biblically? challenge you to grow in understanding and not let you be led astray. Hebrews 10 verse 24 and 25 says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. That's number two. We don't understand. Number three, why we don't long for Jesus' return? We're frightened. And I know this might be true for many of us. Matthew 24 verse 6 says, See that you are not alarmed. Or another version says, See that you're not troubled or frightened. And I used to be very, very fearful thinking about the end times. Um, Honestly, don't have to put up your hand, right? But how many of you think Revelation is a scary book? I remember growing up, right, I, I would do like the Bible reading plan, good Christian student, right, good Christian, grew up in Sunday school. And then when I come to uh, Jude, and then you flip to the next chapter, and then suddenly you see Revelation, and I'm like one of those people with very vivid imaginations. Like I, I, when I read the Bible, I, I picture myself in it. Like I'm there walking with Jesus on the water, you know, I'm there like helping him feed the, the 5,000 with, with uh, bread and fish, you know, I, I picture myself in it. Now for someone with a vivid imagination and reading that Bible at night, imagine opening up the book of Revelation and suddenly there's like, like a horn with a little, little horn coming out from the big horn and then there's like dragons and it's like, it's so scary as a kid. I remember reading it, right? And, and... And when I thought about it, I was like, wow, this is, this is frightening. But Revelation is a book of three things. It's a book of majesty. It's a book of mystery about what's to come. And it's also a book of misery. The reality is there are all these things involved in Revelation. But we need to understand what frames our understanding. It's understanding the kind of book it is. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to lay people. I'm not talking like theological. This is the, you know, like end times prophecy. But what kind of story is it? Let me give you an example, right? Uh, if you watch, how many of you watch Shang-Chi? Ten rings, right? If you went to, no, suddenly everyone's looking out. Yeah, what's he going to say? I, I know some people loved it. Some people like, it was lame. But, but imagine if you didn't know anything about Shang-Chi, right? And you thought it was a horror movie. And you went in and the moment like Aquafina shows up, you're like, ah, something bad's going to happen. Or like Shang-Chi shows up, you're like, oh no, there's a ghost coming or there's a zombie. And you think that something bad is about to happen and you don't understand it because you're interpreting it through a lens that's wrong. But if you understood that Shang-Chi is a Marvel Universe movie, it's a story about good triumphing over evil, it's about redemption, it's about all these things, right? And when you look through, when you watch the movie, all of a sudden, everything makes sense. If we look at Revelation primarily as a horror movie, if we look through the book of Revelation and all we can think about is the dragon and the little horn and the scary scarlet things that will happen, then guess what? We're we're completely missing the point. But if we see it as a story of good triumphing over evil, if we see it as a story of a man who loved his bride so much that he was willing to undergo anything to raise up that bride so she would be like him, that she would love even unto death. And on the glorious day we sang about it, we will see him face to face. The desire of our hearts. If that is our framework, let me tell you, no one's going to have to force you to read Revelation. See, that's the thing about this book, right? What's, what's the last book of the Bible called? It's not Revelations, you know? The last book of the Bible, in, in my version, in, in the ESV, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation. The first line of that book says the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave to his servant, right? It's the revelation from Jesus. It's the revelation about Jesus. 
I remember the day when I realized this, and it totally changed the way I studied the end times. Because at that point, up to that point, I was thinking, man, I need to learn all these diagrams. I need to learn when are we going to be raptured. I need to learn all these things. And then when it hit me, this book is not about revelations. This, is, this book is about a revelation, the revelation. And it's about Jesus and what He wants to do. It changed my approach. Because, guys, I know this is true for many of you. How many of you love Jesus? This was my motivation to study Revelation. If you love someone, you want to know every part of them. If Daniel only wants to love parts of Tammy, Bill and Sarah will have a word with you later. But the point is this. You want to know everything about her. You want to know what her quirks are. You want to know that she's a people person and when she's tired, she needs to hang out with more people. You want to learn all these things that make her unique. You want to even learn the parts of her that maybe you don't like. The scary parts. Oh, if you don't have coffee in the morning, don't talk to her because she'll get angry. You know, you want to learn all these things. If you love someone and you only want to learn an idea of them, then you don't really love that person. You love the idea of that person. And so it hit me If I truly love Jesus, if I want to love him well, I need to get familiar with this Jesus that the book of Revelation tells me about. Revelation 1 verse 3 says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. My friends, this is the only book in the Bible that has a blessing attached to the reading of it. No other book says, if you read this, you're blessed. Revelation says, if you read this, you're blessed. So Jesus often says things like, I tell you these things so that you will not be troubled. All of Matthew 24, everything we're studying this month was to prepare his disciples and give them courage to undergo the darkest days ahead. The book of Revelation gives us a roadmap of the way even to the very end. My friends, when you know the end, it empowers you to go through whatever will come. You know, it's a picture of this. It's, it's, it's like when I watch a movie with my wife, right? And I discovered this after we started dating and watching movies together. Halfway through a very intense movie, she will pull out her phone and she will Google what happens at the end. And some of you are like, what's wrong with that? I'm like, it's wrong. You can't do that, right? Like the whole point is you want to be surprised, right? But but for her, it's like, if I know what comes at the end, I'm okay. And I realized that's actually true for life. If we know what comes at the end, and we said last week, It can be summarized in two words. Jesus wins. If we know what happens in the end and we keep it, we make it our, our, our background, we make it our, you know, when we look at our phone, this is what we see. If we know this and we keep it in our minds, it empowers us to go through any obstacle and any struggle and any tribulation. We know that love casts out fear. To the measure we love, we will not have fear. And we need to feel Jesus' heart and his emotions when he shares with us these things in Matthew 24. When he says, guys, don't be alarmed. Guys, don't be fearful. Why? He was saying this because he knew he was going to be with them to the end of the age. Four chapters later, he's going to tell them, guys, I've told you all these things are going to happen. It's going to be really, 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 really hard. It's going to get really, really bad. But guess what? I'm going to be with you to the end of the age and then it's going to get really, really good. It's like, imagine with me, you're going through exams and you have the best teacher coaching you, telling you exactly what's going to happen, which is what we talked about last week. But then during exam day, he comes and he sits next to you and says, all right, let's do this together. Would you be afraid of that final exam? (laughs) So even if I don't know, I know my teacher is right here. He's going to help me. And that's the picture of what it is for us to go through the last days. He's right with us. He says, lo, I'm with you to the end of the age. See that you are not frightened. 
The last point, why we don't long for him to return. Point number four, we don't know him enough. And let me take you to a scene in the Bible, which is the last time Jesus was on planet Earth. The last time he was on planet Earth is Acts chapter 1. Let me read to you verse 9. And when he had said these things, and this is after Jesus has like a 40-day Bible study. 40-day Bible study with his, with, his, with his disciples. How many of you, if, I mean, Peter Suka here is doing four weeks. How many of you, if Jesus shows up, right, and he says, here's the QR code, sign up for a Bible study for 40 days with me. How many of you would just straight away right now scan and, and sign up, right? Jesus himself, he was with his disciples for 40 days. And then verse 9, he says, when he had said these things, as they were looking on, Okay, imagine with me, right? Remember, I I like to imagine. So they were looking on at Jesus. He's talking. He was lifted up. How many of you think that would be a cool way for me to end my sermon? To be lifted. (laughs) He was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Can you imagine with me? Like, it's, it's not even like, you know, back in... Uh, like 10 years ago, there's the balloon, balloon boy, right? It's not even that, right? It's like him lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, everyone look up with me. Imagine you're seeing Jesus going into the distance, right? Behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? I was thinking, if I was there, I would definitely be looking into heaven. I'm like, I mean, have you ever seen a man fly before? No, right? This is quite a sight. I'm standing there watching and I'm thinking, oh, I wonder how far he'll go before he comes back down. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this defies the laws of gravity. I mean, what would you think when you see Jesus floating up into the sky, right? And then it says, this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go. Why I'm reading this, this last scene of Jesus going is because the Bible says the same way that he left is the same way he's coming back. It's like you take a a, a tape, a, a video, and you play it, and then you play it in reverse. So we have a picture of Jesus, and he's up there. When he comes back, he's going, he's coming back down. In the same way that he left, He's coming back. You know, I thought about it the, when I was, the picture I have is, um, you know, I said I've been here for four, four years, right? I remember the day that I left Penang to come to Singapore. And uh, back then there was no COVID restrictions and all that. So a lot of people could come to the airport, right? And I remember this, and this happens with my family a lot. Um, when you go to the airport, then you, you, you push your stuff, right? And you go through uh, the security gate. You go through immigration. And then there's that moment when you look back. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Those of you who have said goodbye to loved ones or, or you've, uh, whether you send them off or whether you've been the one that went, you push your car and then you turn around. And then you see, I remember that, that day my grandma came and she wore uh, sunglasses into the airport because she didn't want people to see her crying. <laughs> So cute, right, my grandma? Hi, grandma. She, she, was, she was standing there, and, and I remember seeing my family and my friends standing there, and they were all like, bye, bye. I remember turning the corner, and I looked again, and they were still there, like, bye. And it hit me. I wonder if that was what his disciples were doing. You know when you miss someone so much? And you know you're not going to see them again for a long time. You're not going to be like, all right, he's gone, let's go. Great commission, chop, chop. You're going to stand there and what's going to be in your heart? You know, I thought about this. Uh, a friend of mine said this, whenever you find yourself in a rut spiritually, whenever you find yourself struggling in intimacy with God, meditate on His humanity. And I thought that to be very interesting because I would think meditate on the splendor of God, the beauty of God, His excellencies. But he said meditate on the humanity of God. And I thought about it. It made a lot of sense because of this. His disciples missed Him 
because they knew him. Imagine what would it be like. I'm going to get the worship team to come up in a little bit. Imagine what it would be like for them standing there watching him go to heaven, knowing that that was probably the last time that they were going to see him. Knowing that their day to day with him. Imagine his disciples knew him so well. Put yourself in their shoes. Imagine you were you got the chance to walk with Jesus every day in the flesh. Imagine you could touch him. And you knew what Jesus likes to eat. He likes fish, apparently. <laughs> you know what he smells like? You know what he's like when he's tired? And I pictured the scene this way. I pictured John, because he was the youngest, right? And he was the closest to Jesus. He laid his head on Jesus' chest. I'm like, man, if they were, I don't know, if they all had to stay in the same house, probably John would find a place closest to the master. I was thinking, wow. What would it be like to hear Jesus snore? <laughs> he was fully man, guys. That means he probably snored. Because <laughs> most guys snore. Sorry, Shalom. But imagine what it would be like to know him so well. And then all of a sudden, that person that you spend every single day with, every single waking moment, is taken away from you. And then John goes back to the house where they all stayed and he looks in and he's like, wait, Jesus used to sleep here. But now he's not here. And then they go for a walk and maybe John had a really bad day, right? And he looks to his right and he's like, wait, I used to tell Jesus my problems. But now he's not here. Anyone who has felt the pain of loss will know what that feels like. But then Jesus says to them, Guys, if you would take this message to all the world, if you would make disciples of all nations, if you would instruct them everything that I taught you, then guess what? I'm coming back. Imagine if you had the ability to bring back a person that has gone. Someone that you love with all your heart. What would you do? And here the disciples heard Jesus say, if you would do these things, I'm coming back. And all of a sudden, these young men who knew Jesus, Jesus wasn't words on a screen Jesus wasn't a concept that they prayed to. Jesus was their friend. Jesus was their closest confidant. Jesus was their teacher. Jesus was the guy that they would walk with on good days and on bad days. And these young men said, you know what? If it takes laying down our lives, to bring you back. So be it. And that's what happened. These young men, all of them except John, right? They all died as martyrs. Matthew 24, 14 says this, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached, will be proclaimed as a witness, as a testimony. And the word witness is the Greek word martyrion, where you get the word martyr. It's a witness even unto death. See, it doesn't make sense for a bunch of young men to witness even unto death, to die to themselves if all they were doing was to be a good Christian. But if you think about the context and you think about how they walked with their best friend, flesh and blood that they knew, 
it makes complete sense. See, we don't long for someone we don't know. We do not long for someone we do not know. We don't miss someone we don't love. My friends, do we long for Jesus to come back? Do we miss him? Would you just pray with me today? God, we know that when our hearts don't long for your return, God, it could mean that we don't really know you for who you are. If we knew you like your disciples knew you, God, we would yearn for your return. If we had had the privilege of walking with you like those young men did, God, we would give everything to bring you back. But God, you've given us your Holy Spirit. And he testifies of all that you have said. And so in a way, we, we have even what's better than them. We have the indwelling spirit, your very spirit living inside of us. And so God, I'm asking today, I'm asking today, God, that you would awaken our hearts. Jesus, you would awaken our hearts to yearn for your return. My friends, I'm going to invite you even now, if that's you if, you, if you are, if you desire to long for His return, would you place one hand upon your heart? Father, I'm asking for these ones, Father, who set their hand upon the, their hearts right now. I'm asking you would place your hand upon their hearts. Father, I'm asking for the fiery zeal of love to come and ignite and awaken their hearts again, God. God, you say your word, blessed are you. Though you have not seen him, still you love him. God, we have not seen you with our physical eyes, but God, we want to love you. We want to miss you, God. We want to long for you, Jesus. Jesus, we have to know you. To the measure that we know you, we will long for your return. And so God, I'm asking today, would you, by your Spirit, awaken our hearts. Awaken our hearts to long. Awaken our hearts with an ache. Father, I'm asking that we would even feel physically an aching in our hearts today. God, that same thing that we feel when a loved one is taken away, the pain in that heart, let it propel us to embrace the cross. Let it propel us, God, to say yes to what you've called us to do. Lord, that the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom to every nation, we would say yes to that invitation. The urgency of the hour to bring you home, Jesus. Oh God, awaken our hearts. the bride say come Maranatha oh make this your prayer
We don't want to slumber, God. Awake our hearts. God, this is our prayer this morning. Father, for those of us who are indifferent, awake our hearts to make us care, to make us yearn, to make us burn for your coming. God, for those of us who don't understand, who struggle in confusion, God, awake our hearts to understanding, to search you out. You long to be found. You said, seek me and I will be found. God, for those who are wrestling with fear, for those, who have, those of us who are feeling frightened, God, would you fill us right now, tangibly right now, fill us with love. Your love, your perfect love casts out all fear. And Father, for all of us, God, I'm asking, would you awaken our hearts to know you more? To the measure we know you, we yearn for your return. And God, we echo the, the final intercessory cry. In Revelation 22, it says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. This is our prayer and this is our cry. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Josh. Wow, what a word. What a word. Thank you for obeying God uh, at 10 p.m. last night and uh, rejigging it. And I think some of us really needed to hear this. Uh, and I think the, I, the beauty about technology is uh, some of us need to rehear it, go back to YouTube, rewatch it, and, and in our own time, you know, really do business with God uh, for some of the, the, the you know, as, as the words uh, reveals the condition of our heart. Right, I'm going to dismiss the service, uh, but I want to encourage us to, you know, d don't just walk away from a message like that and, and go about our, our lives as per usual again. Right? D don't let that opportunity go to waste. Right? Let me, I'm going to pronounce a benediction. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you for this word today. And, you know, just pray, Lord, that as we uh, reflect, as we dive deeper, as we think, as we let the word soak our hearts Lord Father you will continue to, to awaken our spirit awaken our hearts to long for your return and now may the love of, our, of God our Father the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the sweet sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever in Jesus name Amen Amen alright thank you everyone for joining us uh, have a blessed Sunday those who are in the worship center, we just ask that you remain seated for a period of time for more dismissal instructions. Okay, for those who are here in this place, uh, just gonna ask that uh, we, you know, safe distancing measures. Now. So don't, don't mingle around, all right? And do not consume food and drink on the premises. Uh, if you need prayer, you may approach the leaders or the pastors in charge, right? Uh, their names are on the screen. Uh, so feel free, uh, if you need any prayer, approach them. Uh, otherwise, right, uh, section...